Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Hope you are <laughs> enjoying that music. Uh, my name is Demi Ajayi and I'm an open source community manager here at Call for Code for Racial Justice. And we have a really awesome workshop ahead of us today. Um, I'm joined today by Grishma Jenna, as well as my colleague Ukar Litter, who's helping us behind the scenes. Thanks, Ukar. Um, so as we're waiting for people to join in and trickle in, if you don't mind telling us where you're coming from or where you are in the world today, what the weather is like, where you are. Um, it's officially spring here in the U.S. I can't say it's very warm outside right now where I am in Denver, but the weather's okay. How about with you, Grishma? It's actually a little foggy and cold today in San Francisco, so. <laughs> nice. Well, I guess it's better than snow, so we'll see. I was talking to someone in England. They were saying that they had the best day of the year, the warmest day they've had all year. I wish we could say the same today, but it's all good. Um, any feedback so far from the, anyone in the audience? Let us know where you're coming from uh, and how things are where you are right now. All right. Okay, so without much further ado, I will be handing it over to Grishma shortly. Um, Grishma is a data scientist here at IBM. She has a lot of experience with natural language processing, machine learning in general. So we are definitely um, in good hands today as we move into this workshop. So as mentioned in the registration, what you need to do here is just to have your laptop um, open and ready to follow along um, as we proceed. So before we get started, do want to give you a bit more background into Call for Code for Racial Justice uh, if you're not familiar with um, this program at all. Um, so just a little bit more. Call for Code for Racial Justice is a part of Call for Code, which is a tech for good initiative, uh, which IBM is a partner in. And Call for Code allows developers and problem solvers to come together to address and contribute to solving issues related to um, different uh, open source problems um, that address societal and human humanitarian issues. And the way that we do this is we usually have a global challenge. This is our fifth year of running, and we've had them around different subject areas. We had one around natural disasters, around climate change. Um, and also we had a spot challenge around racial justice uh, in 2020 as a result of the heightened racial unrest in the country. Um, and so as a result, we were able to develop Call for Code for Racial Justice, which is a program under Call for Code that has seven open source projects in which um, people are able to contribute their solutions to these projects that are aimed to tackle various issues related to, to systemic racism across the United States and also across the world as well. And um, in terms of using natural language processing for tech for good, what we found with Call for Code for Racial Justice projects is a lot of our projects actually use natural language processing. So here I have four different projects and I'll talk about them very briefly. And just to highlight the importance of natural language processing and machine learning in general in these projects. So uh, Take Two is a project that identifies racial bias within digital content. So basically it looks at, at text and it's able to classify um, whether or not, or categorize whether or not there's any racial bias within that within that um, text as well. And then we have open sentencing, which is looking at documents to be able to identify whether or not there are any racial disparities in criminal sentencing. So this is both text as well as numerical analysis to better understand whether or not there are um, disparities in how uh, someone who's being charged who might be black is being charged for a specific offense versus someone of a different race being charged for that same offense. And legit info was another one of our solutions, which makes it easier for people to find legislation. So by using legit info, they're able to find the impact areas because a lot of legislation is written essentially in legalese. And it's hard to understand what exactly this bill is about and how it's going to impact you. So essentially legit info utilizes natural language processing to identify and classify what the content of uh, a specific legislation is to be able to identify um, what impact area that it might be, for instance, in health or infrastructure or things of that nature. And Five Fits Voter similarly um, makes it easier to understand what voting resources are 
available to someone who wants to participate in the voting process, right? So there are lots of different deadlines and different things that you need to do to be able to vote. So it makes it easier to find this information. And across all of these solutions, whether it's looking to actively identify bias or just make it easier to access information, um, we see that natural language processing plays a very key role in ensuring that we're able to do that. Whether you're, work, you're just trying to simplify a workflow or actually actively identify bias, we found that natural language processing um, is a great way to tackle these issues. And it's a really powerful tool for tech for good uh, projects, which are often looking at lots of data. Um, well, depending on the application, but some of them are looking at lots of data and looking to make it easier to find insights and to make workflows easier. So um, with that, hopefully that's a good enough teaser to start off with. I'll now be handing off to Grishma, who will be talking a bit more about natural language processing and seeing how we can use that to now apply um, to solutions such as the ones that I've talked about so far. Thanks, Demi. So what I'm going to do today is I'll be taking you through some of the code in my Jupyter notebook. It's completely fine for you to not have Jupyter installed or to not, you know, code along with me, but I did want to give you that resource so you can always refer back to it and go and experiment and change things as and when needed. So let me start sharing my screen and hopefully you can see it all fine. Okay, one second. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. Okay, and this is the place in the GitHub repository where you can find the tutorial notebook. Again, like I said, if you want to code along, if you want to experiment along, go ahead, but it is absolutely not necessary to do so. I just want you to have this resource so you can look back and keep learning. Okay, so we can get started. Um, Demi, can you hear me fine and see fine? Everything okay? Yes, everything is perfect. Okay, great. And I believe you'll be monitoring the chat, chat for any questions as well, right? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So, hi, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for taking out time from your busy schedules and coming with us on this journey of understanding what natural language processing is and how you can apply it for tech for good applications. Um, there is so much need in the world for having applications. I mean, people are working on really exciting things, but I think the fulfillment that you get from working on something that is a social issue or that's going to improve the life of others, that's just a completely different feeling. So I hope that by the end of the session, you feel inspired and create to go back and see how you can make changes in your communities and on a larger scale. So a little bit about me, I know Demi introduced me briefly. I work as a data scientist with user research operations with IBM in San Francisco. And specifically, my role is about infusing data science in user research and design. Okay, you should be able to see this now. Um, I really like public speaking, workshop, workshop facilitation, and creating women and youngsters in tech, uh, which is part of the reason why I'm here. And if you have any questions or need any advice, I'm happy to talk about anything, uh, data science, NLP, or just your career in general. And you can reach out to me using any of these uh, modes on the right. OK. So let's start off with some quiz time. And um, my first question for you is, what language do you think is the most widely spoken in the world? And by widely spoken, we mean in terms of the number of native speakers. Any guesses? And Demi, do we have anyone in the chat who is trying to guess? I haven't seen anything as of yet. Uh, there might be a slight delay. But we did have a question as to whether or not um, your repo is uh, one one guess one guess is Chinese. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. We'll see if we have any other ones. But they also there were also there was also a question about whether or not um, your repo is GitHub.com slash gjenna slash nlp dash tutorial. Yes, that was the one. And let me yeah, I can go back. Have another guess for Spanish here. Okay. 
Oh. Okay. Someone's guessing Mandarin. Okay. Well, the correct answer is oh, yeah. actually Mandarin. So congrats to the one who guessed that. Nice. Okay. My second question for you is, how many languages are there in the world? Just throw a random number out there. If it's lower, we'll just say more languages got developed. If it's higher, we'll just say, you know, we're all busy developing new languages. That's fine. Don't be shy. All right, we're looking forward to the responses in the chat now. And also from YouTube. What about you, Demi? Do you want to oh, gather God, a guess? I should, <laughs> I should know. We have one guess for 300. Um, 300, yeah. Let's see. Uh, 100,000 languages? 80, <laughs> 125. OK. 1,000. <laughs> OK, well, I would say maybe 1,000 so is uh, the closest in terms of magnitude. Uh, oh, I see 5,000. That's actually pretty close. Mm, okay. It is. 7,117. Wow. Um, so that's a lot of languages, right? And how many does the average person know, right? I think I know two, two and a half languages. <laughs> so it's going to be impossible to even get close to hundreds or thousands of languages. But it's interesting to know the kind of diversity and variety out there. OK. So coming back, natural language processing. Have any of you thought about why it's called natural? Why not artificial? And why is it processing? Any ideas about what these terms mean or why it was named a certain way? So the reason why it's called natural is because this is language that is developed pretty naturally or very heuristically, right? in the way that humans talk to each other, it's evolved over time, the grammar, the language, the syntax, all of that. And the reason it's called processing is because it's an interaction between humans and computers. Of course, your computers understand you know, bits and bytes, zeros and ones. So to make them understand something very human-like, like language, is going to need a lot of instructions and a lot of different tools and techniques, which we'll be seeing today. Uh, but that's the reason why it's called natural language processing. Um, so like I said, natural language, it's language that's been developed naturally in use, and it's very different from artificial languages, which in this case would mean our programming languages like Python, Java, C, and whatnot. Um, focuses on the interaction between computers and humans and how computers can understand the language that we speak. It's also known as a subfield of computer science, artificial intelligence, information engineering, machine learning, data science. So there's a lot of overlap in all of these fields. And it could be text or speech based. So it doesn't have to be just, you know, uh, based on written text. It could be based on what you're speaking, what you're recording as well. But obviously, for the purposes of our, um, you know, session today, we're going to be focusing on text based. Some of the examples you might see is if you use Siri or Google Assistant, Alexa, Google Home, a lot of these voice assistants use a lot of natural language processing at the back end. Um, if you're using Gmail or any of the other email clients, there are certain spam filters as well. That's natural language processing. Google Translate, Google search engines, um, trying to understand if people are very happy about a certain product or not. So that could be in terms of you know the social media posts they're making, or even on customer service, if you have somebody who's really frustrated, if you have someone that's a very happy customer and you know is watching for your product, that's again going to involve the use of natural language processing. And um, in healthcare as well, uh, because there's just so many documents and journals and papers that get published you know, by the day. Um, so natural language processing helps you understand what are the most important things that you should look at. Um, you know, All to say, it just means that there is a wide variety of application, a wide variety of usage. And hopefully, at the end of this, you'll get a better understanding of how you can use specific algorithms, specific techniques for each of these applications. OK, another question. Um, let's just say this is a random word I made up. And how would you pronounce this? Well, that's the reason I'm not pronouncing the word, because I would like you to try typing in chat how you would pronounce this word. Now, this is very interesting. Let's see. Let's see what responses we get. Yeah. 
Come on, don't be shy. Well, I guess I'm, I might have a delay on my comments, but I guess Goti, Goti would be my guess. Yeah, yeah. and I see that that's someone else's guess as well. Goti. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? Think, yep. think wild. It's wild. Um, yeah, it's, it's yep. going to be a very interesting yep. answer. Jihati or Jihati. Okay, Jihati. Jihati. Mm -hmm. I okay. believe. Hopefully, I'm saying that. Yes. Uh huh. Interesting. And I'm seeing some of the comments as well. Okay. Any other guesses? Go T. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Well, drum roll. Are you ready for the correct pronunciation? We have one more, one more. Hoti. Hoti. Oh, D, okay. So with the G being silent, yeah, that's that's fair. Okay, now we can go ahead. Okay, all right. Well, the correct pronunciation is actually fish. What? Let me, yeah, let me break it down to you. So G-H could be pronounced F as in tough or rough, you know. <clears throat> Oops, do I not have that? Uh, yeah, never mind. Um, so GH could be pronounced as F, as in tough or rough. O could be pronounced as E, as in women. And TI could be pronounced as SH, as in nation, right? So that's F, that's E, and that's SH, and that becomes FISH, which wow. is pretty interesting, right? I don't think any of us would have guessed this. To be honest, it was quite tough. Uh, but this just goes to show that, you know, we as humans have a lot of challenges when trying to understand languages. So trying to explain languages to computers is obviously going to be much, much more challenging. And there's going to be ambiguity. Same words can mean different things. Um, somebody could be very sarcastic or um, somebody could say something, you know, different depending on the tone or the inflection in their voices. Representation, like I said, computers works on work on zeros and ones with numerical data. So representing something that is full of characters or words is going to be interesting. Standardization, I think a lot of us these days would use, you know, some acronyms like BRB for Be Right Back, TTYL, Documentor. So making computers understand these sort of acronyms is also going to be interesting. Segmentation. Um, this is a challenge that isn't very much applicable for English language, but in certain languages like German, where they have compound words, so two or three words combined to make one long word, that's where it can become really difficult for computers to understand where a word starts and where a word ends. And honestly, just uh, the world knowledge that we have, right, when we were babies and then grew up as children, teenagers, we collected a lot of knowledge around the world, around how things function, the fact that, you know, non-living things are inanimate objects, living things have certain characteristics and behaviors. These are things that the computer won't really understand. Um, so those are the challenges, but, you know, we are going to be in good spirits. We're going to accept some of those challenges and see how we can go through it. So if you tried explaining language to a computer the way you would expect, explain it to a kid, you're going to be very frustrated. That's unfortunately not the right way to do it, but we'll see what the right way is. So today we are hoping to cover these different topics in our agenda. And I, we understand that, you know, we don't have as much time as we would like. So it's not going to be a very hands-on workshop, but hopefully you'll get a good idea or get a good flavor of what natural language processing is and you can continue your journey with the resources that I'll provide later on. Okay, now with this, our first two topics are gonna to be data loading and extraction because we need to understand what data are we working with? How can we find that type of data? And then from then on, we'll go into different characteristics of each of the um, data sets that we have. How can we understand uh, the language and so on and so forth. So meanwhile, let me switch to my Jupyter notebook. And hopefully you all can see this fine. If not, please let me know. 
Um, for those of you that have access to the GitHub, let me pull up that link again. It's this one. Um, feel free to pull up the notebook in the GitHub web browser itself or download it and run it in your local machine or using any of your favorite uh, editors. Cool. I'm just going to pause here to make sure that those who want to follow along are able to do this. Give me a moment and we will get started. So the screen is full screen. Are you able to see this fine? Yes, Krishma, it's, uh, it's coming through fine. Yeah. Okay, great. Got it. All right, so question how many of you are familiar with um jupyter notebooks and it's fine to not be familiar i can give a very very quick introduction um essentially what jupyter is it's one of the foundational tools for data scientists and what it allows you to do is as opposed to your regular software engineering editors where you write a block of code or a program or a script and then run it it allows you to have these separate code blocks. And within this interface itself, you can run a particular code block. You can see what the data is. You can then go back and change, you know, if you're not happy with the results. And that way you constantly have that input and output, um, you know, interface uh, available in the interface. So that's one thing I really like about notebooks. Uh, but uh, yeah, that should be a quick intro. And it does have these markdown cells as well, which are all of these texts and heading cells. So that way it enhances the readability. It's not just, you know, just code and you have no idea what the code is doing, but you can actually understand and supplement it with certain information about what this code is doing, what is the expected result, what libraries are you using, why are you using that, so on and so forth. Okay, so what we're going to be doing today is we are going to be using one of the most important packages for natural language processing, which is called NLTK. And that stands for Natural Language Toolkit. It's a collection of a bunch of different functions and tasks that um, you can do for natural language processing. Um, again, that's the great thing about open source software and just you know a code in general, right? You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You can use a lot of the functionality that is already available to you. Okay, so what we're gonna do is, um, for those of you unfamiliar with Python, uh, we use the import keyword to download packages so that we can use the functionality within that package. And the good thing about NLTK is that it comes with certain preloaded data sets that you can use. So there's actually text from Project Gutenberg in case you want to use the sample data sets, you can go ahead and use that. But oftentimes you either already have a data set that you want to work on, or you have an idea of what kind of data you're looking for. Um, in that case, you can go and try to scrape that data as well. So we're going to be using two very, very small data sets. Honestly, they are more like you know, really small string arrays or lists in Python. Um, so what I'm doing over here in this case is that I am declaring a list with three sentences, which is today is 23rd March. I'm in San Francisco, California, and currently I'm attending a natural language processing workshop. And that's it, keeping it really, really simple and basic. Um, another way, like I said before, is you could actually scrape data from a website. Um, this is quite a common thing to do because oftentimes the data might be hosted in a website or it could be a database. It could be a data set that's you know elsewhere and you need to scrape that information. Um, so one of the ways we could do that is using the request li library and the LXML library. So let's say, for example, the content we're interested in scraping is from the call for code microsite for IBM developer. So let's say it's this. And I want to scrape this paragraph over here. So the way I would do it is that in Chrome or in the other browsers as well, you have an inspect element. And over here, you can go to identify this particular um, area that you're interested in scraping and then copy the X path. Um, again, I think I've pointed out links to do that. Uh, don't worry, you don't need to get into the details of it, but just think of it as having a specific address 
to the particular data that you want to scrape in a web page. So that's what I'm doing over here. This is the name of the site. And this is the exact address where I want to scrape the text from. So once I have that, I can go over and scrape that data. And what this gives you is this. Through Call for Code, top solutions are actively supported, so on and so forth. Deployments are underway across the globe, which should be what we see here. So great, that worked. So we're going to be using these two data sets and playing around with them. So now you understood with what data you want to scrape or what data you want to have. You went ahead, you got that data, or you manually created that data or uploaded that data. Um, but now from that data, you need to start breaking it down into smaller pieces so that you can start experimenting and analyzing each aspect of that particular um, paragraph that you have. So paragraph is nothing but a collection of sentences, right? So what we're going to be doing is we're going to take it, we're, we'll be taking these two paragraphs and we'll be breaking it further down into sentences. And the way we would do that is NLTK.tokenize. So that sub package within the NLTK package has a function called sent tokenize, which is for sentence tokenization. We're going to be going ahead and using that. Um, again, pretty simple. What we'll be doing is we are going to be having an empty list. We will iterate over the data that's available to us, and we'll pass each of the lines in that data or in that list to send tokenize, which will finally give us re uh, the result as each sentence as a different element in the list. So in this case, you can see that it's used the full stops to understand where to break down each of the sentences, which is great. It looks great. Um, we'll do the same thing on our conference data, which, as you remember, is that paragraph we scraped from Call for Code. And similarly, over here, it's able to detect where each sentence starts and stops and break it down. Okay, so we went from that database paragraph to a sentence level, and let's go one level deeper, which is breaking down into words. Very similar to sentence tokenization is word tokenization. And as you might have guessed, we have a function that's called word tokenize in NLTK. Um, very similar format. You just go ahead and instead of send tokenize, you will use word tokenize. The input over here, however, will be the output coming from send tokenize. So it already needs to be in the sentence form. And once you have that, you can go into the word tokenize function. And over here, you can see that it's started to break down each of the words and use spaces and punctuation marks to inform where a word ends and begins. And this is the result for conference sentences. OK, so what we're going to do right now is that this is still a very small data set. But when you have bigger amounts of data, it might be difficult to manually read through it or understand if there are any patterns available. In that case, we are going to be plotting the occurrence or the frequency of certain codes and characters, um, certain words and characters, and seeing if that helps tell us anything about the data. So in this case, we're going to be using matplotlib. For those of you familiar with Python, you might be aware of this package, which is used for a lot of graphing solutions. And then from NLTK, we are going to be using freakdist. And from there, what we're going to be doing is we are going to give all of the words that we got from our word tokenized function, feeding it to freakdist, and it will help us create a graph or a chart with the occurrences. So you can see that full stop occurred three times, I occurred two times, today occurred one time, so on and so forth. And then finally, on the conference words as well, you can see this is the frequency distribution. So I'm going to pause here for a bit and see if you can find anything that's a little strange or a little weird or things that maybe you wouldn't have expected to see on this, um, this graph. Anything looks weird, interesting. Take a look at the x-axis. What about you, Demi? Do you think there's anything interesting about this graph, something you wouldn't expect to see? Uh, 
Oh, okay. Um, and also just keeping in mind our 30 second delay here. Um, let's see, I am, I am San Francisco one. Um, I guess the fact, can you scroll up for the, to see the first graph, the yeah. sample words? Okay, I guess the fact that it's counting, whatever that is, is that a dot as a word or yeah. That's exactly, one. that's exactly the right answer. It seems to be counting punctuation marks as well which is a little interesting. I mean, do I really care about the punctuation marks? Do I even maybe care about the numbers? Maybe, maybe not, depending on the applications. Um, I could go a step further and say that, do I really even care about words that are, you know, stop words, which we like see in a bit, but words like the and for, which are only used more to ensure a correct grammatical sentence instead of them having any meaning as such. So, oops, we forgot something very important to do with the data, which is cleaning the data. That's the first and foremost thing that you're actually supposed to do. But why not? We're going to go back. We're going to clean the data and make sure that we have pristine data for all of our results and analysis. Oh, I see somebody said Zip's law. That's an interesting one as well. For those of you not familiar, read up on it. It really talks about a frequency distribution that you would expect in terms of words. Okay, so coming back to data cleaning, what do I mean when I see data cleaning? Now, honestly, this depends on your exact application, what you're trying to do. But some of the things that you could do in terms of cleaning is removing special characters and numbers. Like I said, they don't really explain the meaning. So you can go ahead and do that. Um, removing stop words, which are the filler words I talked about, like the and or of, you know, the prepositions and so on and so forth. Removing HTML tags, especially if you're scraping raw data from you know, any of the web pages, there could be some rogue HTML tags that you're not interested in. Standardizing words. Um, if you remember, one of the challenges that we saw in the slides earlier on was dealing with acronyms or short forms or slang languages. That could be one of the ways you uh, clean the data as well, making sure that it's all standardized into one form. Converting to lowercase, you obviously do not want something in all caps the exact same word to be treated differently in lowercase. So that's another form of standardization you could do. And one of the reasons that you're doing um, this cleaning is also to make sure that you are efficiently using the memory and the resources available to you, right? If you do not clean that data, you could have a very, very large vocabulary. And consequently, all of the algorithms that you run on it could take a very long time to run. But when you have a really short, focused vocabulary of only things that are important to you, then in that case, the algorithms are going to run much quicker. OK, so again, our good friend NLTK comes to help. And you have a certain list of stop words, which are the filler words I talked about, already available. And you can use those. Um, for, for now, we're going to be using, obviously, the ones for English. But NLTK is also applicable for a lot of other languages. So you don't have to just stop at English. You can go and experiment with other languages as well. So in this case, what I've done over here is I have defined a function for cleaning sentences. And what I can do is that I can either remove the digits or keep them depending on the application. And I'm using something that's known as regular expressions or regex, which helps it detect what are the um, non-alphanumeric characters and removing those. And then we are making sure that everything's in lowercase, so everything's treated the same way. And finally, we have our clean sentences coming out. Um, again, this function over here is looking at each word and seeing if it's a stop word from our stop word list given by NLTK. And if it is, we're just removing it. So let's see what this looks like. Today is, so you can see over here, 23 is missing because we said we want to remove the digits. Um, here are the word tokens. So it's gone ahead and now we are doing word tokenizing on it again. And then these are the filtered words because we want to remove the stop words. And the similar process follows for our conference data set as well. You can see that um, numbers, punctuation marks, stop words, they're all missing over here. OK, so this is great. Um, stop words, reducing our vocabulary. This sounds like it would be pretty useful. But I would challenge you to think if there are any instances where removing the stop words is actually something that is not what you need, 
And in fact, it could have a very negative consequence on your sentences. Um, think about, look at the stop words again. Think about if you would want to preserve them in any case. And there's an example I have in mind, which I'll share with you. But again, I'll pause for a bit and see if anybody can think of any ideas for if you would want to preserve stop words, if they, those would be important, if they could potentially change the meaning of the sentence completely. It's a good question. We're waiting on our, some responses here. Mm -hmm. um, I guess one thing that comes to mind is maybe, maybe in legal documents that might be important. I don't really have much like contracts or something where, well, I guess you would, yeah, like VA or I don't know, maybe somehow that has an effect on those kind of applications where those kind of details are important too. Yeah, and that's quite possible. Maybe it completely changes the meaning. If you remove some of those stop words, uh, it means something really different, which is not what you would want. Um, another example I like to give is, let's say you are searching for a flight. And let's say I want to go from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Now, given this sentence, from and to are going to be identified as stop words, and they will get removed, which means my query now is San Francisco, Los Angeles. What does this mean? Do I want to go from Los Angeles to San Francisco? Do I want to go from San Francisco to Los Angeles? Or does it even just mean I want to go to San Francisco and Los Angeles from a completely third different place? Right? So you can see that in these kind of applications or situations, the stop words are really important, which is why um, you've heard me say this multiple times right now. And honestly, this is something we're going to be hearing in data science. It all really depends on the applications. You need to understand what your context is. What is the kind of output you're looking for? If going through that particular script of, you know, I want to do algorithm one, two, three, I'm going to be doing, you know, my stop words removal and I'm going to be lowercasing it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, maybe that's not what you're looking for. So always keep that in mind. Okay, so the next one that we are going to be looking at briefly is called part of speech. Um, so the different part of speech are things like nouns, verbs, pronouns, adjectives, numbers, etc. And we have a way to do that using NLTK. Um, so over here, we're using average perceptron tagger, tagger, which is just a tagger or a me mechanism that helps you understand different part of speech tags. Again, this is helpful because it helps you understand what exactly the sentence means or what they're talking about. Oftentimes, one word could be used as a noun or it could be used as a verb and it could totally change the meaning of that sentence. So that's a place where this would be really helpful. Um, and the way we would do that is we would just run uh, the nltk.pos tag on that particular word. Remember, we have words, excuse me, available from our word tokenize. And this would give you the part of speech tag or the pause tag for each of the words. So NN stands for noun, RB I think is a verb, um, VBG is like a present verb in present tense. And you can see that there are a number of different parts of speech available. And this is the entire list of what each of these tags mean and the descriptions. Okay. So what we are now slowly starting to go towards is understanding what characteristics exist for each of the words, each of the sentences, and how those can help become features which will then be used in our predictive models, classification models. OK. So the next one we're going to be looking at is called text processing. And particularly over here, we will be seeing stemming and lemmatization. What often happens is that people could be saying the same thing in a variety of different manners. You could be using different words. You could be saying something very differently. Um, so this is where having a giant graph, a knowledge graph of relationships between different words, are these synonyms of each other? Do these things mean completely opposite things? Is this an umbrella term? These sort of relationships come into play, and that's where they're helpful for understanding what the intent or what the meaning behind a particular sentence is. So in this case, we have hypernyms, which is the umbrella term or the bigger category. So in this case, it could be a programming language. 
And hyponyms could be things like Java, Python, C, Scala, Go, JavaScript. So those are the elements or you know, the lower level of that hyponym family. So WordNet, which is that huge, gigantic knowledge graph with all of these relationships, also has things available for definitions, for synonyms and antonyms. So this is some code over here, which you can use to understand what the antonyms, synonyms of a particular um, phrase or a particular word would be. Um, fair warning, this could take a long time to run. So that's why I have these commented up because I just wanted to run a small, you know, uh, piece of code on it. But if you want, you can go ahead and experiment with that. Um, not sure if there are any friends fans over here, but um, for those of you who watch Friends, there was an episode where Joey had to write a recommendation letter for an adoption agency for Monica and Chandler. And he's not exactly the brightest bulb in the room. So what he does is that he writes it, you know, in his own language and then ends up using a thesaurus, which is essentially like a dictionary that replaces his words with you know, more sophisticated or, you know, more intelligent sounding words, which means that his sentence that is, they are warm, nice people with big hearts, becomes they are humid, pre-processing homo sapiens with full-sized deotic bumps, which honestly doesn't even make sense, right? Um, anyway, that was the humor in the episode, but uh, what I've done over here is just use that sentence of Joey, the original sentence, as a um, sample uh, for our algorithm and seeing if WordNet actually ends up with uh, one of these, uh, with this sentence, you know, that they showed in the episode. Um, spoiler alert, it does not, but that's only because the show creators and writers have taken some creative liberty. Uh, but, you know, some of the uh, words do match a bit. Okay. Um, so the next topic we are going to be moving towards is called word sense disambiguation. Um, if you remember, one of the challenges was ambiguity uh, as far as understanding language is concerned. So a lot of the same words that sound the same, that are written the same way, could have completely different meanings. Um, for example, in this case, we're using bank. Bank could be, you know, a financial bank where you're actually going to deposit money or bank could be a river bank, or maybe sometimes bank could even be used as a verb, right? I'm banking on you to help me with this. Um, so what NLTK does is that it has a less algorithm that we won't be going deeper into, but you can go ahead and read this resource, but that helps you understand exactly which sense of the word or which particular meaning of the word is being referred to in this given sentence. Um, so again, that's helpful to see. I'm going to take a very small pause here. Demi, do we have any questions so far in the chat? I will oh, take that sorry. as a no. I was, I, I was thinking <laughs> on mute, of course. I was like, why can't no she? <laughs> no, um, no, we just had a, um, a comment a question about the instructions, but we were able to figure it out. Okay, um, great. Thank you. Chat. Yeah. All right. So, so far we've seen how to extract data, how to kind of deconstruct that data into sentences, into words, how to understand what sense of the word is being used, what part of the speech is it referring to, um, even understanding what are the synonyms, antonyms, definitions, relationships for those words. Um, so continuing that trajectory, we are going to be looking into an algorithm that's known as stemming. Um, in very simple words, stemming just tries to cut the ends of the words in the hope of coming to the base form or the actual form of the verb. For example, you could have words like coding, codes, coded, will code, so on and so forth, right? All of the different tenses of the word code. And what stemming is going to do is it's going to try to remove the S at the end for codes, the D at the end for coding, the ING at the end for coding, in the hope of coming to the base word, which in this case is code. Again, the reason we're doing this is because oftentimes we are not interested on in knowing what tense of the word it is, but we are interested in knowing exactly what that word means, which is the base form in this case. 
And of course, going back to our memory utilization of having a smaller, more efficient vocabulary in use. So in this case, we're going to be using a particular type of stemmer known as Potter stemmer. And we pass the words to the Potter stemmer and it gives us the stems of the word. So today is, is today. This was 23rd, which went to, actually we removed 23. So that's why it just came to RD. March San Francisco currently became current, attending became attend, natural became natter. Language is language without the E. And essentially it looks like somebody is, you know, forgotten to type the entire word, which looks a little weird, but that's how the stems look in this case. Uh, now that is a very crude way of trying to arrive at the base form. There is a slightly more complex way, which is called as lemmatization, which essentially tries to do the same thing, except it's trying to use WordNet, that knowledge graph that we have of relationships of words. And looking at that, it's going to come at a better form of the word. OK, so in this case, we try to come to the base word, but over here, it's known as a lemma. That's why the name lemmatization. And one of the things that the lemmatization algorithm needs is that it also needs the pause tag or the part of speech tag, which our tagger in the initial section helped us with. So we're going to supply that. And then it's going to use the lemmatization algorithm to give us the lemmas of each word. So in this case, you would see that comparing it with the stemming results, it looks similar, except in stemming currently was current, but over here currently still remains currently. Attending is attend in both stemming and lem lemmatization. Natural, if you remember in stemming was natter, which wasn't really a word, but over here it's natural. So what lemmatization is doing that it's trying to get an actual word that exists, unlike stemming where it just you know shows a part of the word. So it's a more complex and sophisticated algorithm. However, it also requires intensive resources compared to stemming. So in that case, you have to do a trade-off between performance and the results or the efficiency, the accuracy you get. Um, if you are okay with having a good enough um, you know, results, maybe like 70, 80% accuracy, but you want it to be done quickly, stemming is the way to go. If you're looking more for accuracy and you have a lot of time and resources, then you can use lemmatization. Okay, so, so far, all of these are characteristics of words, sentences, languages that we're seeing. And like I mentioned earlier, these could become features when you're trying to do machine learning or data science or trying to build predictive models. Um, so these would be the features that help the computer or help the systems and models understand what exactly is this language representing? How is it being expressed? Um, the other thing is that you could also calculate distances between words. Uh, again, we won't go into this in much detail over here, but these are some examples of what distances between words mean. Um, so edit distance is just thinking of how many edits or how many changes you have to make to, let's say, the word algorithm to get algorithm to be al altruistic. So you can see that there are some similar characters, but the other characters you would have to replace or remove something. Um, so this is what that table looks like. OK. And then we also have named entities. Um, named entities are, you can think of them as proper nouns. So they could be the name of persons. It could be organization or company name. It could be a location, a time. And these are also things that inform features of your machine learning models. Um, there's a great demo over here um, that you can go ahead and experiment with but we won't be delving into it now. OK, so to recap, we saw stemming, lemmatization, WordNet, path of speech tag. We looked at distances briefly. We looked at named entities briefly. But how do we go about representing words as you know, zeros and ones or a language that the computer understands? So this is where text representation comes in. Um, our first example is called a bag of words model. In this case, we put down the entire vocabulary. So all of the words that are present in our data set will go on the top you know, as the header. And then you can have the sentence number or the document number uh, on the other axis. And essentially, this is a matrix for understanding if a particular word occurs in a particular sentence or document or not. If it doesn't occur, you give it a 0. 
if it occurs, it, it's a one. So our first sentence in this case has beautiful blue sky. Uh, yeah, so maybe the sentence is beautiful blue sky, which is kind of incomplete, but that's fine. Our second sentence is beautiful blue love sky. That's fine. And let's look at our last sentence would be brown dog, fox, lazy, quick. So you just look at where ones are present, and that is an indication that that particular word is present in that particular sentence. Very basic, but one of the drawbacks of this is that you lose the ordering of words. Um, so you don't know what this person is really talking about, right? Uh, beautiful blue sky is the sky blue, and that's beautiful, or is it a beautiful blue color of the sky? Um, you can really lose the sense of the sentence and, uh, you know, just not understand what it's talking about because what you're doing is that there's no order, there are no stop words available. You just have a bag of words or a collection of random words picked out. Um, again, this is great if you want uh, something that is quick and dirty, that still gives you the results, but in terms of accuracy, not that good. Um, one improvement that you can do with the bag of words is that instead of having just zeros and ones, you could have a count occurrence matrix. So this is a word occurrence. So it's just zeros and ones. But if it is a count occurrence matrix, your one will get replaced by the number of times that particular word is coming. So if blue is coming three times in that sentence, instead of one over here, it would be three. So that's a slight improvement on the word occurrence matrix. So going into something a little more complex and a little more sophisticated is TFIDF, which stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. It sounds really complicated, but what it tries to do is that term frequency looks at the number of times the word I or a particular word is coming on a particular sentence. So it's very similar to this, what we're seeing over here. And then IDF is an inverse log of understanding how many times this particular document, how many times this word comes in a document versus all of the documents that are available. To put it in a slightly simpler manner, what this means is that words that occur in all of the documents would have a very less weightage or would not be given a lot of importance. When you think about this, this maybe doesn't make sense because you start thinking, oh, if it's a word that occurs across all of the sentences, all of the documents, then it's probably an important word, right? But what this takes into account is that you again have a lot of your words like stop words, which are occurring in a lot of documents or they just occur a lot in English language. So this inverse um, component takes care of the fact that we don't want words that occur very, very frequently in the English language to be given, given a very high weightage. Alternately, it also means that we want to look at words that are rare and that are representative of that particular sentence or document and give that higher weightage, as that is more likely to tell us what topic this document is about. So, NLTK again comes to the rescue and helps us with um, count vectorizer, which understands, makes us understand what the counts or this um, occurrence matrix that we saw over here is. So that is what it's doing over here. You're trying to see that it's a list of numbers with counts and the position of each of these elements is corresponds to the word. So in the 13th position is the occurrence for today. In the seventh position is the occurrence for is. Then over here in the 14th position is the occurrence for United. So that's how you can read the results of this. OK, so we looked at our word occurrence, count occurrence matrix. We looked at TFIDF. If you want to go even another level higher, we can go into what's known as word embeddings. Um, you might have heard this term used a lot in the sense of deep learning and you know machine learning models. In this case, what they're trying to do is instead of just objectively looking at one particular word and trying to understand what that word means, they're looking at the context, at all of the surrounding words, the surrounding sentences, and trying to understand, can we establish a relationship between these words occurring in a sentence or between these different sentences? Because usually they have some element of ordering or some relationship together, right? Usually the first sentence 
helps you inform uh, inform something for the second sentence, which helps inform for the third sentence. So that's where word embeddings can be helpful. Uh, we won't be going into detail for this, but just to give you an example, for instance, think of words as a vector in a 3D space model. And in this case, um, let's say you have sentences that talk about walking and walked and swimming and swam. So the relationship or the vector that walking and walked create would be very similar to the relationship between swimming and swam. And how do uh, we know this? That's because the context or the way walking and walked are used is very similar to those sentences or the context in which swimming and swam is used. So that tells you that there is some sort of a relationship between the two. And since it's a 3D vector space model, you are able to look at the vectors and understand what is the relationship between them. Are they really close to each other? Are they completely away from each other? Um, so that's one way you can understand are the meanings close to each other or not. And similarly, over here, we have country and capital, where the capitals of each country would have a similar relationship as that of another country and capital pair. OK, I'm going to take a quick pause over here again before we go into the more of the application part of it. Um, Demi, do we have any questions? Then also, yeah. how are we doing on time? Um, we do have a question here. I think this was on an earlier part. So it says here, given a document, how would you use named entity re recognition to generate a set of tasks from the contents of that document, i.e. physician's notes? That's interesting. So named entity recognition alone will not help you with that. It is an important component. For instance, maybe in a physician's note, you have certain exercises that they're recommending or certain medications that they're recommending so that the named entity recognition would be able to pick up but you would probably need another technique that is more along the lines of text summarization that tell you, okay, instead of reading, you know, let's say two pages of notes, you can get a text summary, which is two lines or three lines of what are the main important points that you need to keep in mind from this particular document. So um, to recap, yes, NER is important, is useful, but it's not sufficient on its own. It would need to be combined with another algorithm like text summarization. Great. Um, and also in terms of time, we have about 25 minutes left. Okay, that's good to know. I think that should be enough for us and we should be able to keep some time at the end for a question and answer. Okay, so, so far we talked about all of the different characteristics of sentences, words, how do we try to extract them? How do we understand what's happening? How do we use entity case functionality? And the buildup so far has been using all of these to become features that we can then use in our machine learning systems. And now comes the application part of it, right? So machine learning, um, very broadly to categorize, there are two different approaches or two different kinds of algorithms. One is supervised and the other one is unsupervised. Now, what does this mean? Supervised means that you have data that is already labeled. So the labels available in the data is what provides supervision to your algorithm. That way you can tell the algorithm, yes, you're right, no, you're wrong. Let's say for instance, spam detection. So in that case, if a particular email is spam or not would become your label and that's what provides the supervision. Um, examples of this would be classification. Like I said about spam detection, you're classifying, is this bucket A, is this bucket B, is this a cat, is this a dog, is this a genuine email, is this a spam email? Another type of this would be regression, where instead of a bucket, you are more trying to understand how many. So it's more of trying to predict what is the forecast going to look like? How many products are we going to sell this year? Um, how many apples am I going to eat tomorrow? That is that number value then helps you with the regression part of the algorithm. So that's supervised learning. The next approach is called unsupervised learning in which our data does not really have any labels available, but that's fine because what you're trying to understand is, is there any structure or any pattern available within the data that you have? Um, so a good example of this would be clustering. So let's say you want to understand um, you're looking at activity data of uh, people buying uh, maybe from Amazon and you want to understand what are the different groups of users 
maybe you have a person who just comes in you know during thanksgiving and christmas and spends like you know $2000 that would be one group maybe you have some window shoppers who are just doing online browsing who probably log in every day or every week but they don't really buy as much so that would become another um you know user demographic and that way you can identify what are the different groups and this can be used a lot in marketing or in understanding what sort of ads to target them with and understanding what behaviors are they more likely to do or not to do and having giving them that you know dedicated specific help or support that you need so that is in the case of um um e-commerce or you know a website like amazon uh, but we're talking about tech for good so let's say for instance you're creating an application for community members of a specific you know city or town and you have an app where they can submit any issues to the local government and maybe your app does some sort of a classification to understand okay who is the right person that i should take or i should triage this issue to should this go to the water department should this go to our electricity department should this go to maybe somebody about uh, you know um, who's dealing with immigration or with home affairs is this something that's completely different we don't know maybe there's a separate body that this should go to so in that way your application could do classification and trying to predict what is this issue relevant to is it a sanitation issue is it an infrastructure issue is it something to do with safety or something completely different um alternatively maybe this application is being used a lot by spammers who are trying to advertise their um sales or you know and that's not allowed that's against the rules so you could have again some sort of a spam detection built in where you're trying to classify okay this does not look like a genuine issue this does not look like somebody who is you know coming from our community and this is just somebody that needs to be reported or banned so that's just one example of where you could use classification so um the next package which is going to become our friend today is called scikit learn which is sk learn for those of you familiar with machine learning you already might um have experience with this so what we're going to be using over here is that our data set has certain news group posts just think of it as kind of like social media posts but back from the day when you know social media platforms weren't uh, as big a thing and these are available for 20 different topics so this topic over here in our case becomes the label and because it's a label that means it's supervised which means that we can now go ahead and do classification over here okay so this data set just gives you a little bit of an information of what are the different topics available so you can see that there's something about atheism something about graphics something about religions politics um what else is there mid east motorcycles baseball so those are all of the different topics that are available in this data set what we are going to be trying to do is that we will try to create a classification model and see if given a particular news group post given a few sentences can it rightly predict what topic it should belong to so first let's see what our data looks like this is our label and over here you have some emails or you know um who it's coming from and then the subject of the email and the content of that okay so one of the important principles as far as machine learning is concerned it's that there needs to be training and test data sets it's pretty similar to how we as humans learn right we attend classes or online courses and that's the training part of it where we are understanding the concepts and grasping the foundations of a particular topic and then we have the testing part of it or the examination where our performance is getting evaluated on how well we are doing do we really understand the concepts do we remember things um similarly for our machine learning models we're going to divide it into training and test set usually test set is about 20 to 25 percent of the data set and the rest becomes training this is to prevent memorization or rote learning um so in that case we wanted to see data that it hasn't seen before and test its performance on that testing data set otherwise what's going to happen is that it's going to start memorizing what the training data looks like and then it's going to tell you exactly what you want to hear um there was this very very uh, interesting um uh incident that happened um so what this group of researchers were trying to do i think there was this research competition where people were given images and um, they had to build a machine learning model that could predict if it is 
a husky or a werewolf okay just looking at that image so they used a combination of computer vision and machine learning to do that and there was this one particular group of researchers that got a very high accuracy of 90 95% which meant that their model was absolutely amazing and it was able to get everything perfectly right like almost perfect and they were really excited and you know they were like yes we're going to become famous and all of that and they go into this conference and then what happens is that um the training data the testing data comes in which is you know unseen data and they actually give it data and they realize that their model is actually pretty terrible now what happened is that what this model did was all it looked at was the background of the image okay now for images of um huskies right the background was often white because huskies are generally found in colder climates where there's a lot of snow and the werewolves didn't have that so essentially what the model ended up doing was that it would just look at the background if the background is white it would say it's a husky and it was right 90 95% of the times so this is where the concept of overfitting or rote learning happened which is exactly what we are trying to avoid by having a test set and showing it data that it hasn't seen before and evaluating its performance on that um anyway so coming back to our code um sklearn has a way to help you split your data into training and test and you can tell it how big you want your test size to be and finally you can use classifiers i guess in this case we are using knife based classifier I won't go into the details of this, but it works on Bayes' theorem from probabilistics, or from probability, and it uh, tries to understand, given certain knowledge that we have, how likely is it that you know this particular sentence or this particular document relates to uh, one topic. Um, all right. So what we're going to be doing is we're also going to be using something called pipeline. What pipeline lets us do is all of these different transformations that we have seen so far, right? Like trying to represent it as a bag of words and then trying to apply classification. It helps us bunch all of those um steps together in a sequence and apply it in that order. So what we're telling over here is that let's use DFIDF factorizer, which if you remember, looks at the term frequency and inverse document frequency of the occurrences of the words. And after that, let's apply multinomial knife base, multinomial because we have multiple topics present. Okay, so this is a very simple uh, pipeline. We just have DFIDF and then uh, we have our normal classifier. And the accuracy of this on our test set, which is I think 25% of our data, which is, yes, it's 0.25, is around 84%. I would say that's pretty good for our very first approach, but let's see if we can try to improve this. So we talked about how having IDF is important because it gets rid of really co commonly occurring words, right? But let's say, for instance, we don't feel like IDF is going to help us. We are just going to remove IDF and we'll just make it TF and see what happens if the accuracy goes up or down. So now that's a vectorizer where TF IDF, uh, but IDF is false. We're not using IDF. And again, the same multinomial naive base classifier. So the accuracy actually became 75%. So the first one was 84%. And now it's 75%, which means that the accuracy fell quite a bit, which just goes to prove that IDF is pretty important. Let's create another model that does TF IDF, but also does top words, um, which if you remember are all the filler words that don't have a lot of meaning. Um, and these are the sort of stop words that it has. So our accuracy is now 87.77. And our first one was 84.6. So yes, there was a slight increase, which means that top words does help in this case. Let's go ahead and um, remove words that don't occur that frequently. Maybe they are misspellings. So let's go ahead and remove all the words that don't occur at least five times. And let's see if that makes a difference on the accuracy. So in this case, now our accuracy is 88.2. So it went from 87.7 to 88.2. So that's a very, very slight improvement, but it looks like, yes, it did help a bit. And let's see, maybe we want to remove words that have frequency of uh, less than 10. Why stop at five? Let's, you know, let's try bigger. 
And let's see, so we were at 88.2, we removed words with frequency less than 10, and we went to 87.4. So the accuracy did fall a bit, which basically means that, you know, you can't keep going on removing words, you'll be ending up with nothing important or nothing useful remo rem uh, remaining in your data set. Um, so it's really about finding that right balance and a lot of experimentation and a lot of trial and error. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and see if we can tune hyperparameters. Hyperparameters are certain um, input or information that you give to your classifier, to the model that you're using, and that helps you um, helps the model take certain decisions. Um, so in this case, alpha is a parameter, and we're just tuning that a bit and seeing if that gives us any improvement. And yes, it actually did. The accuracy is now 90.2. And finally, let's see if uh, we can include stemming and if stemming is going to make any difference because we haven't done stemming or lemmatization at all. All we did was stop words removal and removal of some low frequency words. And now it is 90.36, which is a very, very small improvement. So maybe in this case, stemming didn't help us that much, which is completely fine. Okay, so this was just to give you a quick overview of how all of the concepts that we have learned uh, earlier on today become features and help us inform and improve our machine learning model. So hopefully you got a good, um, good idea of that. Okay, I'm gonna pause here. Um, Demi, are there any questions in the chat? And also I think we have maybe about 20 minutes for the entire session remaining. Yes, that's correct. Um... I'm not seeing any other additional questions that, that haven't been answered in the chat. So one question we had was um, an official link to sign up for IBM Cloud Services. And we've dropped that in the chat. And for people who are joining on YouTube, you can follow along with the links that are on YouTube as well. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna take a sip of water and uh, hopefully all of you are enjoying this so far. Um, like I said, you have the notebook, you have the links, um, experiment, just keep learning. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been really awesome. Um, and lots of great information. I, I was keeping myself on mute just because I didn't want to interrupt you, but there are many points I was like, yeah, this is great. Um, <laughs> we have another comment here. It says, it's really cool to have access to libraries that let you implement complex models in just a few lines. It allows data scientists to be more effective. Awesome presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, why reinvent the wheel, right? When you can actually use all of the wonderful things that are available to you to make something even more amazing. All right, let's go into a slightly different application. Um, this is our second last application. We have one more application after that. So we can wind up maybe in about 10, 15 minutes and then Demi can um, you know, just wind it up as well. All right, sentiment analysis. Um, this honestly, I've seen as um, a lot of uh, a lot of people get excited about this. Uh, it's also, I think, one of the more popular applications of NLP out there. Um, so let's see what sentiment analysis is about. So in this particular example, we'll be using Vader algorithm. Um, in a very simplistic sense of uh, the algorithm, is that you look at each of the words present in a particular sentence. And you just try to understand, is this word positive or negative? Is the next word positive or negative? Or it could be neutral, that's fine. So it's this scale, right? It goes from minus one, which is like extremely negative, to plus one, which is extremely positive. And then anything around the zero uh, mark or the zero range would be a little more neutral. So you look at the polarity of each of the words, and then you combine the polarity of all of the words in that sentence to end up with something that's known as a compound score. Um, so in this case, I have some sample tweets that I just put in. And the uh, Tech for Good example application for this could be, let's say you want to build, and I've seen um, quite a few high school students have done this, where they have an application to detect if uh, people are spreading hate speech, or they are being very abusive online, or they're using you know, a lot of uh, slurs or um, you know, just words that could make the other person feel uncomfortable, feel you know, like really offended. Um, so that's an application you could do. I've also seen that uh, I think some of the social media platforms do that. If uh, any of their users are writing 
any sentences or speech that could indicate self-harm that could be very alarming if they have a risk of suicide um so that's another thing that you know you could potentially use this for so this talks just about the sentiment but when you combine it with prediction or classification uh that could then inform these applications so let's see what this looks like. We will download Vader lexicon from NLTK and our sentiment intensity analyzer. That's the function that's going to help us with understanding the sentiment. And what this is going to do is that once we pass it each of the sentences, it will return to us the polarity score, which is the positive negative scores that I was talking about. So in this case, I have four sentences over here and let's see what the output looks like. I am doing good. So neck over here is the negative score. Um, new is the neutral score. Pause is the positive score. And then finally compound, which is the one that goes from minus one to plus one. So I'm doing good. Good over here, I'm doing is fairly neutral. Um, good over here is a positive score, which is why you see an increase in positive over here. And then you do see some neutral uh, score as well because the rest of the sentence is pretty neutral. And finally, the compound score is 0.44, which is almost like 0.5. So you can see it's kind of positive since it's you know more on the positive end. Um, let's see if somebody says something very hateful, like you're a loser, go to hell. Uh, then you can see that the words loser and hell have actually a high negative score. Um, it's mildly neutral. It's not at all positive. And finally, the compound score over here is very negative. It's minus 0.8. Um, let's look at another one. That's a great movie. You should definitely watch it. Uh, this one has great as quite positive, which is why you have this, you know, 0.5 over here. The rest of it is pretty neutral, which is why there's neutral. There's not any negative um, word over here. So negative score is zero. And finally, the compound is 0.77. Um, I personally don't agree with the score much, but like I said, the algorithm looks at the polarity for each of the words. And in this over here, great is a very positive word. And if you would just see a good movie or a nice movie, the compound score and the positive score would be a little lower. Uh, but that's fine. This is what the algorithm is working like. And finally, we have another hateful one, which says you are absolutely disgusting. You should be punished. Um, that has a negative score. And that's, again, finally, uh, has a very negative compound score of minus 0.7 as well. So hopefully, this gives you an idea of how you could use sentiment analysis, like everything in computer science, in code, in life. Nothing's going to be perfect. But hopefully, this gives you a good starting ground um, to understand how you can start detecting the sentiment of um, written speech. I'm going to pause here briefly as well to see if there are any questions in the chat about um, this application. Yes, uh, we have a few questions, two on sentiment analysis, as yes. well as one on um, an earlier topic that we covered. So I'll take the sentiment analysis questions first and then sure. move backward. Um, and if anyone else has questions, please do drop them in the chat and hopefully we'll be able to get to them as we're answering these questions right now. So the first question uh, from me is, um, is punctuation factored into sentiment analysis with any of these out of the box packages? Because obviously like, you know, question marks, exclamation points might have an effect on that. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I'm not sure if any of the algorithms have, but my sense would be or what I would do is make sure that I am not doing that cleaning. I'm not removing the punctuation marks. Uh, I'm also not standardizing the words in terms of the casing because, you know, people could write in caps lock and that would mean that they are screaming or they could have like four exclamation marks versus one full stop that could have a very different sentiment. Um, I can't answer really if the algorithm is going to give different scores or not, but I would say that's an interesting experiment to try. And yes, it should inform. So that would be a great use case for when you shouldn't be cleaning or removing all of the punctuation marks or you know standardizing the words. Okay, great. And another question here is, um, can sentiment analysis also handle slack like, or sorry, slack slang like this is sick, um, which is you know more of a sick is good, not bad in this case. Right. 
Yeah, I don't think this particular algorithm does it, which is what I was saying, right? The drawback is that it just looks at the polarity of the words. Honestly, that's a perfect use case for uh, looking at the word to vec algorithm that we saw earlier, because then it can look at the surrounding sentences, at the context, right? Now, if I just say this is sick in written speech, you're not listening to what I'm saying, you're just reading this is sick. You don't know what it means. It could mean that you know, this is bad sick or it could mean good sick. But maybe if there's a preceding sentence that says, oh my God, that new movie was awesome. It is sick. Then that could mean that, yes, the previous sentence had a positive sentiment. So it could help inform. That's where your word to WEC will understand what the context is and will tell you, okay, in this context, sick actually means a positive thing. Or maybe it could say something like, you know what, I'm not feeling too great about this. Then, you know, this is really sick, this is terrible, then in that case, it would look at the context, the surrounding sentences and try to understand that, okay, in this case, sick is not doing well. Um, so to recap, or the shorter answer is that some of these algorithms don't do it out of the box or don't just alone do it, but in conjunction with a lot of things that we have learned today, um, you can create a slightly more complex model that takes into account these edge cases. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and. Finally, the other question that we had earlier on was around the other um, part of the notebook we were looking at. The question is, how did you find out that the alpha hyperparameter should be 0.05? I think this was back in the machine learning model. Right, yes, that was in um, one of these over here. Like I said, honestly, I did a bunch of trial and error. There are certain values that, um, you know, uh, people usually suggest for some of these really common hyperparameters and models. I consulted that, but honestly, apart from that, it's really just a bunch of trial and error. You, you know, you start increasing a bit, start decreasing a bit, seeing if the performance increases or does it plateau or does it fall suddenly. Um, but honestly, yes, it's just trial and error and just, you know, seeing uh, what works and what doesn't. Okay, great. And then we have another question back to sentiment analysis from Umer as well. Um, is there a way to contextualize sentiment analysis? Yeah, I think that's kind of related to what I was saying is that you could have parts of speech tag, you could have word to work, you could have a lot of the other uh, concepts that we learned today. And in that case, you would then build a pipeline that looks at, okay, maybe sentiment is this good. Look at punctuation marks. Is, uh, is somebody using caps lock? Let's right. look at the sentences before and after. Let's maybe look at even the user's activities at historical activities. Maybe this is a person who just talks like this all the time, or maybe this is a person for whom this is a very anomaly, uh, anomalous thing. We have never seen this kind of behavior before. So again, um, to recap, sentiment in, in uh, analysis on its own is it's not going to be sufficient, most probably in most of the cases. But when you start combining it with all of the other concepts that we have learned with some of the other algorithms and applications, that's where you can go to a really robust model that would be better at understanding if something is truly positive or negative. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, let's go to our last application, which is topic modeling. Um, it's one of my favorite ones and something I actually end up using a lot at work. Um, so topic modeling is unsupervised. If you remember, unsupervised does not have those labels. We're just trying to understand the inherent structure present in the documents, um, which is why it's called unsupervised. And clustering is a great example for this. We're using a different library this time. It's called GenSim, which is also a great um, NLP library that's specifically useful for topic modeling. And the algorithm we'll be using in this case is latent directly allocation, or LDA for short which sounds very fancy and very confusing, but um, all it says is that topic modeling, where we're trying to understand what topic does each of the texts correspond to. Um, it means that each document that you have is a collection of topics in certain proportions, right? And each topic in turn is a collection of words or keywords in certain proportion. So to repeat, Document has multiple topics in some proportion, some ratio. Topic has some keywords in certain ratio. That's what LDA works on. That's the principle. So what we're going to do over here is take some articles from Wikipedia and see if the topic modeling algorithm that we built is able to detect um, what topic a particular you know, um, Wikipedia article should fall under. 
Okay, um, an example application or a tech for good application for this could be maybe there is um, a disaster recovery program, disaster management program going on, and you are looking at tweets that people are putting out in real time, people who are on the ground who are affected, and maybe they're giving helpful information to, uh, you know, their first responders. Uh, maybe they're telling things like, oh, you know what, do not use this bridge over here, or, you know, this uh, over here looks like it's not usable or maybe people over here in this particular area of the region need a lot more help. Um, so just trying to identify what tweets have helpful information and separating it from things that could be spam or things that are not as useful or not related to disaster recovery. Again, just an example application. Okay. So in this case, we are also going to be importing the Wikipedia package. And what that helps us do is it fetches the articles from Wikipedia website, and then we can use that as our data set. Um, what we're going to be doing is all of the uh, concepts that we learned earlier in the session, uh, which is stop words, stemming. We're going to be using all of that to clean um, the Wikipedia article. So we have a really efficient and small vocabulary. And then finally, what we're going to be doing is using our GenSim, which has the actual topic modeling LDA algorithm. So in this case, what I've done is I have collected a bunch of Wikipedia articles, namely one on disaster, another one on government, the English language, computer programming, tsunami. And then just to make it a little random, I'm also asking it to fetch two random articles. So in this case, it's gotten Beres Bridge and Hardaspur Raibareli, uh, which is, I think, a location in India. OK, so what we're going to do with our algorithm is that we will actually use bag of words to convert our sentences into you know, numbers that count occurrence matrix. Um, and then we'll see if the algorithm can rightly detect uh, which topic is closely related to tsunami. So in this particular uh, example, tsunami is our test set, which is why you're seeing over here, I'm making everything except the last, which is the minus one element. And we are throwing all of the others into our algorithm. So this becomes our corpus or the training data. So here I'm calling the LDA model from Jensen. I am telling it, hey, here is my corpus, which is the bag of words um, converted one of the Wikipedia articles except tsunami. Um, over here, you actually need to specify how many topics you are expecting, which sounds a little unfair because if I knew the number of topics beforehand, I probably wouldn't be doing this. Uh, but again, uh, like with the hyperparameter one, it's again just trial and error and trying to see where you hit that good point, inflection point of, you know, it starts to really go bad from here on. And then finally, you try to print the topics. So to remind you, a topic is nothing but a collection of keywords in certain proportion. So the numbers that you're seeing over here is the weightage or that proportion for each of the keywords, which are the words and quotes. And over here, what you're seeing, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, those are the different topics. Um, so over here, I've specified that I want six different topics to come. So 0 to 5 are the different topics. So let's go to the results. The zeroth or the very first topic talks about village, Devon, Beres Bridge. So I think this is that Beres Bridge random article. Um, the second one talks about programming, language, computer. This sounds like computer programming. Um, next one talks about disaster, nature, human hazard cause. Seems like this is about disaster. Next one is about govern, state, politics, democracy. So this one is about governments. Um, last one, um, second last one is Village, Devon, Beres Bridge. Sounds like it's again Beres Bridge. And finally, English language use word, which is English language. Um, instead of this, we can just go ahead and visualize it using Word Cloud, which is another pretty amazing package. And we visualize this. So this is where all of our topics have come up. And finally, to check with our training, uh, with our testing data set, if the training was done good enough or not. Remember, we took out that tsunami article and we kept it aside. Now we're going to check which of these topics that we have over here is tsunami most relevant to. So let's go ahead and do that. And it says that it is most similar to topic number two, and it has a similarity of 0.4. And topic number two is disaster hazard, nation, nature, human. 
it sounds like yes it would be more similar to disaster because it is a type of disaster and it wouldn't be that similar to any of the other topics over here um so that is an application of topic modeling and trying to understand how natural language processing falls um with that but hopefully this was a good over this was a good overview of all the different things that you can do with natural language processing and trying to understand what are the basic foundational concepts that you need to be aware of what are some packages that you can use and i guess i will stop here since we are almost at time and over to you demi all right thank you i'm going to actually come off mute this time all right thank you so much grisham it was really awesome having this session lots of information was kind of a whirlwind through everything thank you so much for having these great examples as well um so now just to finish off uh i think everyone can connect with you on twitter a debate lover how else can they reach you yeah twitter um linkedin everything's fair game all right awesome and additionally we have a few questions in the chat so we'll try to answer those um just shortly after this because we're out of time um but if you are looking to get connected to our community to see how you can use uh your skills or develop your skills in NLP to help with tech for good projects you can join our call for code community if you go to ibm.biz/rjslack it's been in the chat as well as on the screen here and um when you do so you'll be able to build skills contribute to social good network with problem solvers and also turn your ideas into action you can also visit our developer.ibm website to learn more about our projects and there you can look at our tutorial specifically this tutorial on um take 2 uh which we'll also drop the link to in the chat as well as the other tutorials here which are utilizing natural language processing so thank you everyone for joining us today uh we'll definitely will be happy to continue chatting with you um and look to connect with you on the next event thank you so much